not see those fares for the next number of years. Michael O'Leary speaking there, and he says the fare increase is all down to increased fuel costs. In recent decades, as airfares have decreased, the number of flights has increased, meaning more people began taking short breaks and long weekends abroad on top of an annual holiday. But then we had the pandemic, and now we've got fuel shortages and increased business costs, and they've all driven up prices. So is he right? Is this the end of the £10 flight? And do we therefore foresee the end of those short trips abroad that so many people were making the weekend off in Rome or whatever. Maybe you're somebody who who never had that privilege and you're you're quite glad to see it ending for others. Or you're thinking, no, actually flights should be more expensive. We do need to fly less often. Or are you thinking, no, I'll just pay more to get away because it's so important. Do get in touch. 88291. Email vine at bbc.co.uk. WhatsApp us as well on the long number. Simon Calder joins us, travel editor for The Independent. Simon's currently in the USA. Professor Kevin Anderson is professor of energy and climate change at the University of Manchester. And uh, Kevin, you haven't flown since what 2004 yeah that's right yeah from last flight was 2004 because you don't feel good flying well i I work on climate change and i think it's really important that we demonstrate at least some link between our sort of day-to-day lives and what we're prepared to do relative to the arguments we're making about reducing our emissions and i think flying is one of those really emblematic issues where it's a huge amount of emissions and usually most of it coming from, from the relatively wealthy who are frequent flyers. And if people like me who work on climate change, you say it's a really hugely serious issue, aren't prepared, aren't prepared to make those sorts of changes, then that undermines the credibility of our arguments. So I think it is incumbent on me to, to not fly. Simon Calder, can you defend the £10 flight? Uh, well, as long as they are not used frivolously, I certainly can. Indeed, I came out here not quite on a £10 flight, um, a £12.99 flight, not as far as Detroit, where I am now. Uh, very annoying me, by the way. The Motown Museum is closed. <laughs> um, but I flew from Luton to Dublin for £12.99 uh, in order to avoid air passenger duty. And uh, then I flew on an Irish airline across um, to uh, Chicago. So um, I am here on a three-week trip. I'm making absolutely the most of it. And therefore, I think people uh, should have the freedom to fly, but don't just go off on a day trip to Dublin for 30 quid because you can. And by the way, there is exactly no prospect of those £10 fares going because actually the uh, Ryanair business model and indeed that of Wizz Air, the two ultra-low airlines, is that you fill your planes at whatever price you can get. And as long as you've got people paying effectively marginal cost, um, then you will continue to cut fares. But what Michael O'Leary was really doing was softening us up and saying, hey, everybody, get used to the fact that um, you know, your average Mediterranean trip might have cost um, a couple of hundred pounds two years, three years ago. Now it's going to cost three, four, three or four hundred pounds. And certainly everybody this summer is finding that, oh, Mikey, look at those prices, whether it's across the Atlantic or simply to the Mediterranean. But I'm, ge- I'm guessing, Professor Anderson, you see that as, as healthy because it will mean there is less air travel. Well, I certainly want to see a lot less air travel. But I think we have to be very careful about this, this language, the we, the everybody. Now, according to the Department for Transport, you know, not a left-wing think tank Department for Transport, about half of the UK population doesn't fly in any one year. About 70 to 75 percent of all flights are carried out by just 15 percent of the population. The people who are driving the flying growth in this country, the people who are responsible for the lion's share of the emissions from aviation and indeed probably every other sector as well, are primarily relatively wealthy people. It's not people occasionally flying once every two or three years to Benidorm or Torrey Molinas. We like to blame them, but it's actually the relatively wealthy, frequent flyers that are driving emissions up from aviation, and they're responsible for most of that. So this we and everyone, we have to be very careful about this. And the other part of this, when we talk about the freedom to fly, I think more importantly at the moment is the freedom from being suffering the impacts of climate change. And we know who they are. They're generally poor people a long way from here in climate vulnerable zones, typically people of colour, and they've not been part of of, of this problem at all. And they have never flown. So I think this freedom issue is a real 
is a real sort of often misused. We should really think about their freedoms to live good lives first, and secondly, then say, well, we should be able to get on and do what we can, provided we're not going to infringe on their freedoms. And flying is such a large part of our missions. There are no technical ways out of this in the short to medium term. The only way we're going to deal with this is by reducing demand. But we must not impose that unfairly on on average income or poor people who occasionally fly. It's the wealthy who fly frequently. Well, in that case, you've got... Because you, sorry, you, I was going to interrupt because you can't do it through ticket prices in that case. You have to do it through some sort of rationing and you say Absolutely no one not, can yeah. fly more than 20,000 miles a year. Would that be acceptable? Yeah, we, something like a frequent flyer levy. So that the more you fly, the more you pay per flight. And I don't just mean an extra £10. That's not going to affect people that fly regularly. You really have to ramp up the prices dramatically to stop people flying these numerous times that some people are doing. The, so, yeah. Simon, you, you said at the beginning, I was just interested, that you said that you flew to Dublin to avoid the, what was it, the carbon tax? Air, air, air passenger duty, which is £84. Well, it's portrayed as a, a, a an environmental tax. It's actually just a revenue raiser. Um, and that actually speaks to Professor Anderson's last point, which is that you introduce a frequent flyer levy and people are very simply going to, well, they probably take a boat across to uh, uh, Dublin and fly from there, or they take Eurostar to Brussels or Paris and fly from there. It simply won't work. And also there is no, you know, if it, I, I absolutely agree that taxation is a really important part of this. But you do that by going um, much more for business and first class travellers. If you're travelling on Ryanair or EasyJet or Wizz Air, you're on a brand new plane, um, it's filled to the gunnels, as everybody knows, to their discomfort, and that's about as undamaging as you can be. Of course, it's still causing harm to the uh, planet, but also bear in mind there were really that, that's significant... Wrong, that's wrong. What's wrong, Kevin? The, the, the climate doesn't care whether the Ryanair flight is full of people or it's, or it's empty, other than a little bit of difference in the weight. Um, the climate only cares about the fuel that's spewed out, the CO2 molecules that are spewed out of the jet engine. So however efficient you make it, that doesn't affect climate change. Now, what the problem is, OK, if you're going to fly X number of people, making it more efficient is better. But we're talking about reducing demand. But I don't, what I don't that, understand, Kevin, about your, um, your sort of approach to it is surely you've got to cut the numbers. And it, I know you won't yeah. like it, but if you say only Russian oligarchs can fly, let's take a crazy example, then you'll have virtually no flights. Now, you'll say that's not fair because they're rich, but that's the way to cut the numbers, isn't it? To restrict well, no, no, flying no, no, to the no, no, very I, wealthy. I, no, the frequent flyer levy would do it. And I'm just completely disagreeing with this idea. I'll get a boat to Dublin. If you're going to fly away for the weekend, you think you're going to get boats to Dublin so you can get a cheap flight. Or you're going to get the train. You're going to go down to London, because not everyone lives in London, surprisingly, down to London to get the Eurostar to Europe so you can then fly away for the weekend. It will dramatically cut how often the frequent flyers fly. Simon, you think so? Damn sight more inconvenient. So, the, so uh, well, the, I, 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 it, it's been talked about for many years, this, and the trouble is it's always been way too difficult to organise. I mean, you've had in... <sighs> Uh, in, in the manifesto for the Liberal Democrats um, and for the Green Party, people will only be allowed one flight a year and any more than that you have to pay more. Well, if you go first class to Australia, that's going to have an awful lot more effect than if you just take a cheap no-frills flight to Spain. And so you've got to work out what the criteria are well, just do mileage. Just, achieve. Just say... Uh, you, yeah, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. But yeah, then again, absolutely. Yeah, how do you do mileage, Professor? Because if you say we can only do one flight to Australia a year, that for somebody else, that's 25 flights to Rome. Yeah, so no, no, we can't. Yeah, but what you're looking at here is you're trying to find a perfect solution. We need to find, we need to dramatically reduce the demand. And that's across the board for these things. But I would say these sort of slight difficulties pale into insignificance compared with living in some of the poorer parts of the world, realising that your agriculture has failed, realising you've got migration issues. Those sorts of challenges that people are facing day to day are the real issues we should be focusing on. Instead, we're saying, oh, it's a tad difficult to, to organise a frequent flyer levy. This, you know, let's get a grip. We're not talking here about just tweaking business as usual. We're talking about fundamental changes to our lives because lots of people are dying today at one degree centigrade of warming and our preference for the wealthy particularly to carry on with high emissions whether it's flying or big homes or large cars is actually going to cause a damn sight more damage to poorer people and indeed our own children 
today. So Thank you. Thank you very this, much. This is a real issue. Thank you very much, Professor Kevin Anderson, passionate professor of energy and climate change at the University of Manchester. Simon Calder, who's on the USA tour at the moment via Dublin, travel editor for The Independent. We're talking about whether the end of cheap travel, £10 tickets to Rome, is a good thing. Pussy, 